Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays at the De Young. My name is Renee Villasenor, and I'm so glad you could all join us. Tonight's program is in support of the exhibition, The De Young Open, now on view at the De Young Museum. We are so excited to host Isabella Holland, the Curatorial Assistant of European Paintings at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming Isabella as she explores the De Young Open's historical connections to European public art exhibitions from the 17th and 18th centuries. Take it away, Isabella. Thank you for that introduction, Renee. My name is Isabella Holland, and I'm a curatorial assistant with the European Paintings Department at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Normally, I'm based at the Legion of Honor Museum, where our collection of European paintings is, is displayed. Tonight, I am so excited to be talking about the De Young Open and its connection to public art exhibitions founded in France and England almost 350 years ago. The De Young Open brings together 877 works of art by 762 artists living and working in the Bay Area. Art is shown together all at once in this amazing floor to ceiling display that for me is such a new way of experiencing and looking at art. However, it's not new. The concept of the De Young Open and its hang draws from the Salon founded in Paris in 1667 and the Summer Exhibition founded in London in 1769, which were public art exhibitions founded and organized by Royal Art Academies in France and England that wanted to elevate the fine arts. They did so through a programming of exhibitions as well as art school. And it was really their intention to promote a distinct style of French and English painting. As I said, they were ran by academies the Salon originated out of the French Royal Academy, the Académie Royale de Pente et Sculpteur, founded in 1648 under the regency of Anne of Austria, who was the mother of King Louis XIV. The Academy was run by artists. Elected artists were called academicians that were exclusively patronized by the monarchy. At its inception, elected members held the sole privilege of exhibiting at the salon as well as invited guests like students. Most likely a response to the French Salon as well as the French Royal Academy, the Royal Academy of Arts was founded in 1768 by a consortium of painters, sculptors, and architects and backed by King George III. The summer exhibition launched quickly after its founding and employed an open call submission process like the De Young Open that allowed elected members as well as independent artists to submit artworks for consideration with ultimate selection being made by elected artists. And these academies and these exhibitions were so important in introducing contemporary art to the public in London as well as Paris providing these audiences their first exposure of a contemporary art and artists and the artists of their nation, just like the De Young Open is providing an experience for the Bay Area art community to gather together. These exhibitions used a hang that was space maximizing attention buying experience for audiences. However, there was definitely an intention to this curation. This setup replicated the domestic interiors of European aristocrats, as well as eminent church officials with their private art galleries. I've illustrated two examples below where you can see the abundance of art just communicates the vastness of a personal art collection and the wealth of this collector. Translated to the salon and summer exhibition setting, you got a sense of the abundance of the artistic achievements of French and English artists working. It also showed and presented artwork as highly valued personal possessions, admired by many, but only owned by a few. Who then got the prime placement within this hang? Brand history paintings, as well as sweeping portraits hung on the line, which I've outlined right here, kind of the central space, 
while landscapes, genre scenes of everyday life, as well as still lifes skied above over here and hung below these gallery anchors. This rank corresponded to a subject rank developed at academies that placed subject matter on a hierarchy and communicated the value of a subject to audiences. I love that so many paintings that hang now at the Legion of Honor received their public debut at these exhibitions. And when we look at this gathering, which I've kind of made in a mock salon hang, you can see the type of artworks that display this academic style. The academic style loved looking at art of antiquity. You can see in this landscape set in the classical past. They loved to create art, create art imbued with moral messages that they could part impart on the audiences through examples of sacrifice and heroicism. However, there is also the practical function of the salon and summer exhibition to showcase the talents and the tastes preferred by artists, as well as by the monarchs and their entourages who patronize them. This is this quartet of the four arts was commissioned by Mademoiselle, Madame de Pompadour, the official mistress of Louis XV. But before its installation at her private residence, it was displayed at the Salon of 1753. There was also many examples of portraits that hung at that salon and the summer exhibition where artists could perhaps attract their next sitter. However, who determined which artists made the cut? These decisions were made by elected Academy members, exclusive bodies, primarily composed of male artists. And on very rare and very limited occasions, few women were part of these academies. However, they were never included in decision-making processes. However, they were invited to participate in the salon and summer exhibition. In England and London at the Royal Academy of Arts, Angelica Kaufman, as well as Mary Moser, were the only two women artists who were part of the 36 founders of the Royal Academy of Arts. You can see that they are represented right here because they couldn't be in the presence of male models with all the other founders. And while they participated in the summer exhibition, they were never invited to participate in the selection and hanging committees that determined the curation of the exhibition. Additionally, after Mary Moser's death in 1819, the next woman to be elected into the Academy was not until 1936. However, I wanna focus on the careers of two women artists who are represented in the collections of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Anne Vallier Coster and Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, who I'm extremely obsessed with, are contemporaries of one another, and they were both part of the French Royal Academies, which stipulated that only four women at any given time could be members. I want to trace their careers at the salon because you can see the limitations that women artists faced. Anne Vallier Coster was admitted into the French Royal Academy in 1770 and made a smashing debut at the 1771 Salon where she displayed 11 paintings, a huge number, that showcased her talent and technical dexterity in the still life genre. She obviously made such an impression that Denis Diderot in his critique of the Salon of 1771 commented, if all new members of the Royal Academy made a showing like Mademoiselle Vallier's and sustained the same high level of quality, the salon would look very different. And try to imagine the salon, it's packed with art. You can see artworks and artists pitted against one another and how amazing it was for Vallier Coster to attract the attention of Diderot. In addition, she would attract the attention of Marie Antoinette. But I also want to consider that as a specialist in the still life genre, which ranked as the lowest subject matter within the hierarchy advertised by the Academy, that she was still able to gain notice. The still life was actually a popular subject depicted by women artists. And this was because they were barred from the life drawing classes hosted at each Academy. 
It was deemed improper for women artists to be in the presence of male models as well as female models, which were needed for the execution of grand history paintings. And this prompted women artists to turn to subject matter readily available to, to them in, the, in their daily lives. However, how did Vijay Lebrun get a model for her Bacanti, shown here on the left, which he displayed at the Salon of 1785? Vijay Lebrun is probably best known as the preferred portraitist to Queen Marie Antoinette, but when she was admitted into the French Royal Academy in 1783, she sought to be recognized as a history painter. The Academy would only allow her in as a portraitist, a genre which she nevertheless innovated. And we actually have a portrait by her on view in Gallery 16. But you can see that throughout her career, she tried to engage with the tenets of history painting, knowing what the most esteemed art forms of her era were. I also love this quote to the right, which was made by an anonymous female critic of the 1785 Salon, where she sums up perfectly, severe masters will always be astonished that a young woman of charm and delicate constitution could have conceived such a bold undertaking. As a budding art historian, it's definitely a major importance in the field of European art history to resurface the stories and narratives of female artists. This is often aided with primary documents. On the left-hand side, you can see a Royal Academy exhi exhibition guidebook, which lists the um, artworks that Angelica Kaufman debuted at the 1780 Summer Exhibition. And on the right-hand side is the pamphlet of that, um, the critique of a female critic that I just quoted from above. And it really goes to show that the Salon and the Summer Exhibition provided women artists a rare opportunity for their artistic output to be publicly recognized. This was important because it provided an actual face-to-face -face contact with audience members, but also the importance of criticism for art critics to write about artists, to build their reputation in the press as well as the public. I could go on and on about the subject, but it's important to note as what's happening with the Salon and Summer Exhibition in the 19th century. But when we evaluate the careers of women artists, it's important to notice the difference between participation and decision-making. And this is what the Salon, the Summer Exhibition and its organizing institutions are going to have to grapple with in the 19th century when they contend with the political climate completely shaped by revolution. In France, the French monarchy gets guillotined as well as their institutions, including the French Royal Academy. However, the Salon remains and its production is transferred to the oversight of the new government. However, in France, there are many political regimes in the 19th century and the Salon actually outlasts nine political regimes and it is at the service of the government. And it definitely reflects the priorities of the government who controls its production. It completely reaches its peak under Napoleon III in the Second Empire. Napoleon III creates a whole new building for the Salon in 1855 and he merges it with a bigger Exposition Universelle, which was supposed to show off the talents of French industry and art making to the world. Again, it's amazing that we have something in the collection of the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco that testifies to this story. On the right is a painting by Horace Vernet, seen from the French campaign of 1814, painted though in 1826, but it was part of a retrospective mounted for Vernet at the 1855 Salon. And we can see that Vernet is a testament to this old French style and art making that's being shown at the Salon. And it's definitely a priority that art making and art viewing is a national priority and it's part of this nation building exercise. The Summer Exhibition is also changing in the 19th century. In 1869, the Summer Exhibition moves to new quarters 
as it's expanding. In fact, both the salon and summer exhibitions are at their peaks. Thousands of artworks are being displayed as social reform is making both art making and art viewing a more commonly practiced art leisure activity. In 1869, as it's going to Burlington House, we actually have a recent acquisition, William Holman Hunt's The Birthday, that received its public debut in 1869 in this new venue. William Holman Hunt was trained at the Royal Academy in London. However, he was a founder and part of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which was composed of young artists who completely wanted to revolt against tradition and institutions like the Royal Academy of Arts. They did this through their artistic style. You can see in the birthday, there's this vibrant coloring and tactile brushwork that is completely in rejection of like the licked canvas, which shows no texture in earlier paintings that were typically displayed at the summer exhibition, as well as the salon. This painting must have been an anomaly at the 1869 summer exhibition because one critic noted that Mr. Holman Hunt, who is in the academy as an exhibitor, but for reasons best known to himself, not of it. As a summer exhibition and the salon are growing, more artists are able to participate. However, many artists still have to juggle with the fact that their display of their artwork still hinges on a jury. And this jury normally prefers, prefers an academic style and artists are very much critiquing juries who they see as self-serving and kind of self-perpetuating. And they are purposely using their art to go against tradition in this artistic protest. And this is happening at the exhibitions themselves, which you can see with William Holman Hunt's The Birthday, but also through the creation of alternative exhibitions. I think the most famous one is the Impressionist exhibition, which ran from 1874 to 1886, that was completely formed in response to the Salon. It was formed by artists like Monet, like Degas, who were rejected by the Salon and wanted to control their own career and have autonomy in the ways in which their art was displayed and talked about and appreciated. On the right hand side, we have an artwork that now hangs in Gallery 19 by Raffaelli, the absent drinkers that was displayed at the sixth Impressionist show in 1881. And we can see how in its style and in its subject completely rejects the academic style that we saw in the previous slides. Its subject matter is unidealized people in urban Paris. And in style wise, it's completely this flickery brushwork. It's not this focused composition and there's no legible narrative that's supposed to show this moral story of heroicism. And in order for the Impressionist show to be successful, you definitely needed to get the critics and audiences on your side. I love this quote again, drawn from Edmund Durante in the new painting published in 1876, which was kind of to rally support for the Impressionists. And he said, but then why you still ask, do they refuse to send their works to the salon? If we begin to extricate ourselves from the system, we will never convince other artists to abandon it either. This rebellion against the summer exhibition is also happening in London with the creation of the Grosvenor Gallery in 1877, which runs until 1890, which is again, a private viewing space for art. This is the preferred venue of artists associated with the aesthetic movement who critiqued the bureaucracy of the Royal Academy of Arts in London, as well as the summer exhibition. They created artwork meant to evoke a sensory response. And the Grosvenor Gallery actually used a display that provided more space between artworks, prioritizing a personal connection between an artwork as well as an individual audience. And this is what we see today when we go to the museums and what I see when I go to the Legion of Honor as well as the de Young. So now as we are brought here today to 2020, we can see the ways that the art of today relate to historical precedents. The Salon drew its last breath in 1880 when the French government transferred control of the production to a society of artists. 
the summer exhibition still continues to this day in London. But when I was researching, researching this topic, it was amazing to see the position of artists and how these institutions and these public exhibitions are shaping the way that they're creating art, knowing that their art is going to be publicly viewed, that it's going to be critiqued and analyzed. And there's also a kind of a certain criteria that they have to fill in order to even get up onto the walls that are being made, these decisions being made by Academy members. However, it's important to note that they also wanted to find subjects that would resonate with their audiences and that made their artwork relevant to the general public. This is exactly what's happening at the De Young Open. It's created, it's completely created in the Bay Area. It's showcasing Bay Area artists producing artwork that completely testifies to the experience of people living in the Bay Area in 2020. However, it's so amazing to kind of create these connections between the past and the present. The De Young Open is in physical dialogue with the De Young Museum, as well as the Legion of Honor, in that it shares a connection with the artwork of the past and being part of these public exhibitions. And how do this framework for looking, shown in the salon style, influence the way we experience art? And really, it's just for me about asking those questions. What am I seeing? Why am I seeing this? How does it feel when I'm seeing it this way? And this has just been a wonderful experience to actually look at art in our own collections and to draw out these very specific narratives that they bring and relating that to the present day and making it relevant to audiences today as well. So that was my very quick presentation. Renee, if there are any questions. Thank you. That was so great. Um, we have a couple of questions. Perfect. Um, we'll start with a fun one. I see someone is commenting about the great background that you have. Is, oh, your, yeah. <laughs> is your home art hung salon style too? It is hung salon style. I'm actually at my family home right now. So this is a la Diane Holland and her eBay collection. But it definitely is something that people are experiencing with today. There's something actually quite lovely, I think, about the composition, just in terms of space, making things fit but it's also seeing what connections can you draw from artwork. So it's completely still relevant today. Um, this is a follow-up question for me. Um, did your, does your family have an on the line? Do you, do you see a pattern there? So I have to say that we don't really do on the line because we don't have grand history paintings or sweeping portraits. We're more of like a landscape still life family. So we're kind of getting there. We have more of like the artwork that would be skied. But I think that it's also interesting that you point that out because even though Valier Coster, bringing it back to Valier Coster and women artists, but even though that they created small compositions that was still able to attract the notice of audiences, perhaps because they could actually connect with the subject matter being displayed. And maybe because it was hung lower, you actually had more of a visual contact with that artwork as well. Perfect segue into our next question um, from Tess, who says, on the topic of ladies, if the female artists attending the academy weren't included in the lessons male artists received, what was their academic experience like? And how did they even make it to the academy? That's amazing. That's an amazing question. I do want to highlight that when I was when I was thinking about the biographies of Angelica Kaufman, Mary Moser, Anne Valier Coster, and Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, mostly they had family members who were artists. They had fathers who were artists or husbands who were artists and that kind of enacted their artistic education. But it is important to note that this was done in private. They weren't allowed in the Royal Art Committee or art academies. Yes, they could be members, but they actually couldn't participate in art making practices and art making was done in private. However, also members, I do wanna also make note that elected members of the academies often had side gigs as teachers to women. And this of course was a class question. It was often women of a certain class who were able to afford those lessons and engage in art making practices. And I think that it's because these women had connections with male artists perhaps associated with these art academies that enabled them to join them. Wow. Um, I have another question, this is mm -hmm. semi-related, um, is 
when did salon install go out of style? So if we're talking about how um, there's women who get limited entry and mm-hmm. o- there's only real entry from people that they know, if all these people were very involved in the salon style, when and why did it go out of style? That is a question from Joanne. That's a great question. I was thinking about this because when, um, it's important to think that the Salon and Summer Exhibition provided audiences with their first exposure of art. And in the 19th century, you have the development of museums, which is now kind of taking over that control of providing audiences with contact with art and spaces facilitating art. The salon style was actually used in the 19th century when museums in America are being founded and they want to replicate the salon style and like the European style for their own art institutions. And I think that when you're kind of getting to the 20th century, kind of that like white cube gallery space, it becomes more preferable to have this more one-on-one experience with the art. And I think that shift is happening in like the 1950s on. And I think that today that's just the typical style that's employed with a display of art. It's really like this individual artwork, like this artistic genius rather than a salon style which shows everything all at once is reflection of more so the country pr- production rather than individual artists. And I think that's actually an interesting contradiction that I battle with of yes, art one-on-one versus like illuminating the genius of a specific artwork, but also is it more democratic to have all artwork shown at once. Don't know if that answers the question, but (laughs) my best ability, I think it's a great way that we should be concentrating more on display sometimes rather than art and to kind of notice how these institutions and the preferences they have for display shape the ways in which audiences judge, evaluate and experience art. Speaking of audiences, this is one of my own personal questions. Um, who was the audience for the original salons? Um, And do you think it changed drastically when the governments took over in the 19th century, um, as well as when museums started to form? Yeah, so for specifically for the salon, it first started in 1667 as like a casual space where elected members would display their artwork for a few public. And this was often displayed in the royal residences associated with the monarchy in Paris, like the Palais Royal and the Louvre. And that's actually how the salon got its name from the Salon Carré. And these were more casual experiences, but when the monarchy gets the guillotine, which I love saying, um, and the French Royal Academy is abolished, the state takes over art making, art production via the salon, and it's showing that art is in direct service to the nation, not the monarchy. And it's actually important for them, I think, to open up the salon more to get the public, the republic, the people looking at the art, because it's something that bonds the nation and actually is bonding this new government and this new people as they are transitioning to a new government. And in France throughout the 19th century, as I said, I think that the salon outlasts nine political regimes. And you can see how these institutions and these productions actually aid the government at their time. And you can see art that supports certain idealizations or supports certain moralizing messages that would kind of aid the government in charge. And audiences. So yeah, so it becomes definitely more democratic and much more of a spectacle in the 19th century. For the summer exhibition, um, when it was first launched in 1769, they're actually the guidebook that was produced. It was, I believe, one shilling to get into the Royal, into the summer exhibition. And this was, a price was imposed because I wanted to like weed out the true art lovers from people who just wanted to see the spectacle. Um, this, so, uh, someone in the chat, Francisco, asked a really, really great question that kind of follows up directly with what you just talked about, um, with the Royal Academies and the Salon being displays of national art. So Francisco asks, if the French and British Salon and Royal Academy shows were a display of quote unquote national art, what do you think the De Young Open says about Bay Area art? That's a really great question. I think that in so many ways, the De Young Open does borrow from these historical precedents, precedents, but it is has evolved so much. And that actually the De Young Open used a blind jury process. So jurors had no idea the names of the artists who were submitting. 
And this allowed for art to really be based on the artwork itself. And I think that as we move into the 21st century, art making is so much more widespread. And I think our definitions of what art is has changed. It's not kind of like these normal subject matter that you see at the salons and Royal Academies at the 19th century, but our own like expectations of what art is has shifted as I think like we move towards like more democratic processes. And I think it really shows like Bay Area that we are kind of like an art center and that there's a very specific style that we engage with. And I think that I want to go back more to the De Young Open more and more to kind of see the art being on display. And if there's something that kind of like speaks to what living in the Bay Area art Bay Area is now, because actually a lot of art really references what it means to live in the Bay Area now. And it's amazing to have this sort of like resonance between people who live there and people who are creating art in response to those experiences. I don't know if that answered that question. I think you definitely need more time to think about that, um, especially in the context that it's uh, a smaller exhibition and very localized. Thank you. Some people have specific questions about the Young Open. I know you weren't part of um, the jury process. Yeah. Um, but someone was curious about how the layout was decided. Um, and then another question was asked about how long did it take to hang around 870 plus beautiful works. Um, so I think, I think I know that it's subject. It's layout. by subject, yeah. And you can definitely see by subject, you can see portraits grouped together, still lives grouped together, cityscapes grouped together. And I believe that the installation took around two weeks from my is, knowledge. Is that the average time of an exhibition? Uh, yeah, it, it's 800, it's two weeks. It's really, and it's also not even the two weeks, but also we have such a great staff that it takes so much time just to like get this layout and that this was completely in response to this time that we're living in now and that we were able to so quickly jump and kind of create this display. Um, hang the artwork, communicate and message the artwork so everyone can visit the exhibition because it's amazing. So I think, I'm just wondering when it, when it was first announced in April. So think of like April, May, June um, to its opening in October, September. I'm losing track of time. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like pretty amazing how quickly they were able to get it ready for everyone to see. And just mm -hmm. knowing about how happy everyone is for the Bay Area, I think it's just great, um, which is a bit a bit like the salon and the academy in the past. Um, but I think it's much more personal considering, um, you know, shelter in place and COVID, and that a lot of these people like they are more accessible than the artists before, um, which I think is really great. And I think we have one last question that I would like to ask you from a personal point yeah. is you mentioned Vijay Lebrun before, and I know you did a presentation on her. Um, so I thought we'd end on something fun for you is, why is she one of your favorite artists at the um, Legion of Honor? That's a great question. And thank you for asking that, Renee. Um, well, I think I first was struck by Vijay de Blanc because we have a portrait that hangs in Gallery 16 that I am completely amazed at. And I also want to note that we only have three women artists on view at the Legion. And this is definitely a reflection of a lot of museums worldwide, that so much more research can be done with our own collection in trying to like resurfaces, resurface the narratives that have not been told before. And I think that, yes, she is a woman artist, but for me, it's actually so much more fascinating to see the factors that really influenced her career. She also wrote a memoir that I was reading that really documents her experience and the different struggles that she goes through of having to flee France at the onset of the French Revolution because she's so attached to the French monarchy, making her own money in exile. And she's continuing to produce artworks because she loves making art. And I think that is just such an amazing story. And it's something that as I hope to be an art historian, I love the idea of going back to primary documents and seeing how artwork is being talked about and being digested at this time. And when I was reading her memoirs, looking at her paintings, looking at a painting face to face, I got this like sense of really knowing it and connecting to it. And that's why I really enjoy talking about her um, 
because I think that more of these stories should be told and we ha and if we have the energy to do so, it's important to do that. Thank you. And actually we got one question that I think is much better than mine okay. from Joanne in the chat. And it says, this will for sure be the last question. If you were to do a salon style exhibition from the Legion's collection, which pieces would you include? And I'm sure it goes without saying that Vijay Lebrun's piece, um, some of them might be in there. Actually, I would hang everything in storage, salon style. Just to think of like, what if we put actually like everything on view salon style? Um, just to get the sense of like showing what we have and that we have this like really interesting collection and we have a collection, you know, like just even thinking about artworks that were displayed at the summer exhibition and at the salon to know that they've lived these lives publicly before even being on display in San Francisco and to think of it originally hung in these displays. I'm actually changing my answer. I would <laughs> salon style hang all the artworks that got their debut at the Salon and Summer Exhibition to get a sense of what it felt like for an audience member to see the artworks in this setup for the first time and what impact that had. I think that's the perfect circle, the perfect right? tie back to the beginning. <laughs> Thank um, you. So we're out of time, but if anyone has any questions, they could please send them to publicprograms at famusf.org. Um, and Izzy, do you have any last words before we go? No, I just want to say thank you, Public Programs, for having me here. And I hope that everyone can go to the De Young Open, as well as going to the Legion of Honor to see paintings that share in that public art exhibition history. Thank you so much, Isabella, for that insightful talk. The De Young Open is now on view at the De Young Museum, and tickets are selling out fast. We recommend booking your tickets online in advance at tickets. Dot F -A -M -S -F dot org. Join us for the next three weeks as we hear from some of the artists featured in the De Young Open. See you next week.